Welcome to the Metaphoricist Magazine podcast, your home for beautifully made speculative fiction. The magazine is edited by B. Morris Allen, and I'm your host, Matt Gomez. This month's story is The Bloodless Cut by Evan Marcroft. Evan Marcroft is a speculative fiction writer from California, currently making his lair above a laundromat in the heart of Chicago. Evan uses his expensive degree in literary criticism to do menial data entry and dreams of writing for video games, but will settle for literature instead. His works of science fiction, fantasy, and spine-curdling horror have appeared several times in Metaphoricist and elsewhere throughout this dark and unruly internet. Find a complete list at evan-marcroft.squarespace.com or on Twitter at evan underscore marcroft. That's E-V-A-N underscore M-A-R-C-R-O-F-T. Let's jump in. I glance at the bracelet on my left wrist. 19 minutes and 58 seconds, it reports. 57 now. 56. Meanwhile, the door is dilating shut behind me until it disappears entirely, rendering the 7 by 7 meter cell as airtight as something meant to hold monsters must be. The room is almost entirely featureless, the bed just a pillowless slab of the same impervious substance as the floor. No faucets or drains, either. I wonder idly where water comes from, where waste goes. Light emanates directly through the walls, and with no shadow in which to hide, the room's ghost haunts in plain sight. She sits upon a backless stool in the geometrical center of the room, facing a vertical blue stripe on the wall that creates the illusion of a window slit. The pale arc of her back resembles that of a flesh-tearing fang, with a ratty black tuft skewered on the tip. Her gossamer shift conceals nothing, not her rippling alabaster ribs, nor their dermatitic rosettes. 53. 52. This dwindling time is the last we'll ever spend together. Dr. Nichere. Her voice is a dungeon hinge shedding four months of rust. It's good to see you. I'm happy my teacher came to visit. Teacher. I want suddenly to bite my fingers, but I've had years to master the urge. I wish I could say the same, I reply, on both accounts. Is it done, then? Has the peacock finally scratched the fox's eyes out? It was inevitable, once the fox lost its teeth. I adjust my spectacles. The word is unconditional surrender, as of two weeks ago. The rebel princes are all in custody or dead. This madness is done. And yet an emperor still sits the sapphire chair, the prisoner muses. But then I long suspected that would be so. You were always so stubborn, doctor. The shadow of an accusation chills me. Just before you arrived, a guard gave me this to drink. Her hand swings out, holding a paper cup too small to choke on. Was it poison? It tasted sweet. The empty file in my pocket smolders against my thigh. No, but you are to be executed today. A choice made above even my lofty reach. Were it my call... This woman would fall into a gap in history from which she could never climb out. Water on white canvas. The news soaks spotlessly into her. That's good. I can almost hear them now. The public, that is. Out there baying for my death. Seeing it is the most important thing. The spectacle always is. The spectacle is all. How did she know? I tell myself that anyone could have guessed a crowd of thousands surrounded the citadel of scales, all jostling to witness the moment the guillotine falls. But nothing is certain with this woman. Even these walls can't guarantee they'll hold her even when all logic says they should. I turn over my palm. A silver tablet, pillowed in calloused pink corduroy. A gentle toss. Halfway to the prisoner, it unfurls propeller arms that lift it into a stable orbit. Her ear twitches towards its fey hum. What's this, an autoquill? His perpetual will has commanded your final words be documented for historical and scientific purposes. I can't help but flinch as she swivels to face me with a motion so smooth and unsignaled it is almost mechanical. 
Four months of solitary confinement are etched invisibly into this woman. Her bun is solidly black where my curls run with autumn colors. She seems too young for this aftermath era, also unlike me. My lines deep is grief. That's not the emperor I know, frowns Vasani Stereo. What combination of words is he hoping to hear, pray tell? Everything, I say simply. Our wars are lousy with criminals who would rather not be infamous. Some of the best worked for me. You'll find them hardly the cackling villains that popular conception make of men like them. They're the ones in the backgrounds of the declassified photographs, the little ones with the shiny spectacles and soft, nervous faces. I was only following orders. They invariably plead until the guillotine cuts them off. History remembers them with a kind of smirking scorn, as if their real sin was a dearth of pride. That is not Vasani Stereo now, and it wasn't her then. No student of mine ever made excuses. She arrived at the Kuntelsian Empire Military Defense Institute a serious, almost solemn scientist, deferential to her superiors, a reliable volunteer for undesirable chores. The same as all the bland brains I employed. My subordinates all came from the top academies, and I assumed her story was formulaic. I scarcely noticed her then. Just another set of hands to help screw together my grand designs. For years, that was the way of things. It wasn't until our hands met within the innards of the same town-flattening rocket that I noticed how quickly Vasani had climbed to where I was. As we scrubbed our greasy hands at the same sink, I saw that her fingertips were chewed to rubbery coarseness. And the following month, when word reached us that our rocket had transmuted an entire enemy battalion into radioactive bauxite sculptures, she spoke only to suggest how the effect radius could be expanded, tugging at her gloved fingers all the while. It was then I knew I'd needn't ask her story. Your reflection remembers where you've been. Care to sit? There's plenty of floor. I don't have long, I say. And it's easier to run from a standing position. I'm only realizing now that I really am in here with Visani, sharing her air, her proximity. There is a circle of red paint in a three-foot radius around her stool. While she remains within this circle, my safety is guaranteed outside of it. But that assumes anything is guaranteed near Vasani's stereo. Suit yourself, she shrugs. How have you been, Marcel? Is your littlest well? I understand young Vasri endured an aerocopter accident some months ago. My breath catches at the sound of my son's name between her teeth. How does she know about that? How, after everything I did to keep my son invisible throughout the war? My hand tightens involuntarily around the file in my pocket, almost crushing it. I force myself to let go. What's done is done. What's known is known. And I have 18 minutes left to work with. I'm not here to reminisce. If you won't answer my questions, why should I answer yours? I've been authorized to administer force. She once described my stare as surgical. You take people apart with a scalpel and forceps. Now I wish I could swat away her gaze as it probes with implements beyond my imagining. That's not you, she says disapprovingly. Don't tell me you're still the Emperor's little do-anything device after everything that's transpired. Did that war we fought teach you nothing? The auto quill whirs needily in every small silence. What I say next, I say as quietly as truth must sometimes be. His perpetuity, the emperor, is a lion and a son. I speak only with his voice. It's where I place the stresses that make Vasani's eyes sparkle with convincing mirth. I have also watched soldiers cackle as they die. I have difficulty interpreting expressions, but I have rarely missed the knack. Why would I? The face speaks a language that means nothing. Your master will get what he wants, but it will be of no use to him. Why? I demand, suddenly suspicious. That smile. That awful scalpel-cut smile. I've given her the tool to slice me open and do with me as she pleases. 
I catch my fingers creeping toward my lips and force them into a fist. I don't like that she knows this, but if I am ever to understand what killed Vasani Stereo and came to live inside her skin, I must endure her, as all her victims did before me. Because what I do is no method that can be taught, she purrs. Rather, it is a height of craft reachable only through a supremacy of will far beyond your emperor. But you, Dr. Nichere, I suppose you may understand. A finger stands up on her hand, translucent around the edges where the light perforates its meatless skin and blurs the shadow of her bone. My foreboding doubles and redoubles again when two more join it. The perfect torture requires the mastery of three impossible cuts, she says. Let us discuss the first. The Unhealing Cut Vasani Stereo vanished a week after the schism that split the Empire in two, a month before the war began in earnest. Abducted by the enemy was what I first suspected. I would only learn the truth once the screaming ships came home. The first few clashes were a series of successes for the Emperor's peacocks. We smashed the foxes at Thoracic Ridge, at the Glass Plains, drove that cabal of rebel princes across the River Coil, all within the first few weeks. The foxes fought cleverly, but my brain was itself a military asset. The state-phasing ghost rounds I provided made a joke of enemy body armor, while my magma mortars flooded emplacements with fire. The campaign proved taxing even so, but if we could just push through and end the war fast, we could spare those soldiers yet outside our firing range. Then came the so-called Just Offensive, our chance to liberate the rebel-held Chelanon and unseat the foxes from the region. The town, however, sat beneath a fearsome gun fort, and it threatened a grueling siege. A siege that never came to be. The night before our assault began, soldiers began complaining of ants infesting their bedrolls. They went to their medics reporting insect bites and were given standard-issue salves, which did not work. Within the hour, itching progressed to burning. Within two hours, that burning worsened into a pain so unbearable that men begged for fewer limbs. Dawn broke over a siege camp in chaos. Six in ten had been stung, and no combination of painkillers, styptics, or sedatives could ease their agony. The true horror, however, lay dormant for weeks, waiting for those soldiers to be packaged home aboard what came to be called the Screaming Ships where our best military scientists could only scratch their heads. I examined the victims myself, ears muffled against a wailing that only a hacksaw could quiet, and reached the same conclusion which the following years would prove true. The pain was permanent. Those bitten would howl forever. The Emperor's war ministers were in a fury, partly of fear, partly envy. How? they demanded. How was it done? How could we do the same? Specimens recovered from Chelanon offered few answers. Magnifying only a few degrees beyond their chitin revealed a labyrinth of manipulated genetics impenetrable even to me. But that mystery was, itself, an answer. Biofabrication was never my specialty. Some passengers of the screaming ship still live. In hospitals they reside now kept in medical comas from which they are woken for mere minutes of the year to plead for sleep or death, confirmation that what they suffered not be forgotten or escaped. A man stung on the finger could lose a finger. A man stung on the leg could lose a leg. A man stung on the breast? That man was damned alive. Our armies never returned to Chelanon. The ground there was cursed, and the only shots fired there were suicides. While I toiled in my laboratory devising weapons that could terminate life ever more efficiently, Vasani Stereo had already determined not to fight a war at all. Would you prefer I had bombed them, Dr. Nichere? Her expression betrays only infinite patience. She will die waiting for the answer she covets. Sixteen minutes, forty. Yes, I admit, under time's duress. I would have preferred that you bombed them. Would you have done it? Monster that she is. 
Of course she craves more. I've never once made a tactical decision, I begin. But, you know I try and speak with soldiers returning from the front. I listen to their stories and what they tap out on my hand with the fingers they have left. A life you cannot live is worse than hell, Vasani. You replaced everything those soldiers might have felt with fire. I don't see why you couldn't make it quick. The corner of her mouth twitches up and her eyelids droop. I'm sorry, that must have been difficult, is what I'd normally trust that face to say. That would have been a waste, Vasani says, almost tenderly. A body can be written off in a ledger. Numbers never persuaded anyone. Is that not why you meet with soldiers? Because their words say more than the official report ever could? You can chew if you like, by the way. That's a very her thing to say, both mocking, caring, neither, and both. I dig nails into my palms in a substitute stimulus. Life is the best teacher. And life taught you to fear pain before death. But remember, pain is the younger monster of the two, born only when death for the first time ever failed. You taught me so much, but you never appreciated suffering for the resource it is. Tanks and artillery are only vehicles for the delivery of pain, and less. The threat of it. The execution of it. Proving our stockpiles are full. That is how castles fall and monuments rise. Before there were words, there were rocks and sharp sticks. Knuckles across the eyes. Do what I say or else. Speech is a useful abstraction, but torture is, and always will be, humanity's first language. Do you disagree? 16 minutes, 38 seconds. War, too, is an abstraction, she continued. It is the democratization of torture, but the objective remains the same. We're always looking for ways to extract consequence without dirtying our things, even understanding that the cost will always be brutality. I simply did away with these unnecessary abstractions and returned to our species' roots. There's a sickness percolating through my guts. I'm 19 again, watching my professor spread a fetal piglet's numbles to show how they work. Here is the liver. Here is the spleen. Here is the heart. Remember to take careful notes. You can't honestly believe what you did was preferable to death. Only when death manifests as warfare. The weapons you and I designed reaped soldiers by the thousands, yet took only a moment's hurt from each. How is our foe to fear that? A flash of agony, then peace? Do you take a sip of wine and toss the bottle? That young, dumb men still strapped on boots and rush against your invention should tell you something, Dr. Nichere. War is wasteful. She shakes her head. Were one to transmute the body's total potential suffering instantly into energy, it would wipe the emperor's palace off the map. I hope she's speaking colorfully, not theoretically. I've seen too much of Vasani's technology not to be wary. You and I both sought to extract the greatest consequence from the smallest bloodshed, she says. But only I dared approach it. Only I dared touch the sublime. My fingertips are itching furiously. What you fear more than pain and death alike is perpetuity. A body can endure unimaginable suffering, but the mind dreads forever so badly that it chooses instead to age. Only once you accept the infinite suffering within can you take the first step towards where I stand now. 16 minutes, 11 seconds. The first cut is the unhealing cut, the wound that does not close. Pain is the power source you turn to when all others are exhausted, and when released it must be explosion of consequence enough to lay armies flat on the ground. This you saw for yourself at Chelanon. And in the survivors who begged for death in my arms, I counter. A simple smart fiber nanomesh added to our soldiers' fatigues gave our soldiers no reason to dread a bug bite ever again. I finished the design in the night. The next month we pushed into Fox territory from further north and seized the Kruholodon Mountain Manufactory Complex. This cut of yours came to nothing. Vasani's lips purse. Maybe so. But remember, doctor... I had only just begun my journey. 
in two motions, hip and spine, she ratchets upright, and I take an unthinking step back towards the door. Fifteen minutes, my bracelet assures me. Fourteen now, in fifty-nine seconds. Vasani smiles. Be at ease. You're perfectly safe. But that reaction, yes, that is illustrative. For fear must come before the cut, doctor. The flesh must know it is to split. That must be its dreaded destiny, and for that, your cut must violate all boundaries. Physical, spatial, temporal. You must make an idiot stroke capable of slitting the impossible. The Untethered Cut I would only learn exactly how the foxes swayed Vasani to their side in the war's aftermath, from documents recovered at one of her secret laboratories. The covert politics aren't terribly relevant. Knowing my student, I spared little thought for the resources those rebel princes offered. I only ever stared at the white blanks between the lines. What she never asked for in words, but received nonetheless. Always were Vasani's reasons her own, and never put to paper. It wasn't long after Chelanon that the emperor ordered a new offensive, this time into the Valley of Ten Lakes. If successful, it would have brought our forces practically to the fox's stoop, but that basin between the mountains was a fungal forest riddled with swamps, sinkholes, and blinding miasmas. Worse, the foxes had seeded the area with gorillas who knew secret trails and spider holes from which they could nip bites off our lumbering platoons. With the memory of the screaming ship still fresh, I designed respirators that adapted to the marshland's infinite poisons built exoskeletons that could weather envenomed bolts and parasitic larvae. Thus equipped, the Imperial 31st Scouting Brigade began to make headway again. By the third night of the third month, our forces had very nearly cleared the valley. My mistake was thinking Vasani would repeat herself. History is smashed in that godforsaken valley. There is no complete record left of what exactly happened to the 27 soldiers of the 31st who vanished into that malarial hell. Progress halted as the fragmented unit dredged the bogs, finding nothing. Either the swamps had swallowed them, or something that digested bone and body armor. Then, six days and sweltering nights later, the Imperial 31st leapt awake at a screaming amongst the trees. Not animal. Too familiar. There came a frantic splashing and hard, scarred soldiers fumbled for their guns. They waited tensely for the wailing shadows to tell them what was wrong. Then at last, a figure burst out of the reeds and into the firelight. A shambling corpse, it seemed, green with algae and embarrassed with bug bites, until suddenly it raised its hands and called for help. They called it a miracle that all twenty-seven escaped. None could quite recall how exactly. Even their time in captivity was a nauseating blur. What mattered was that they were alive, unharmed and homesick. All twenty-seven were sent once to the capital to receive a hero's welcome. I intercepted them before they got that far. For weeks I subjected them to every test possible, yet for the life of me found nothing amiss. The men remained in good spirits, eager to hold their children again. It wasn't until they were safe amongst their families that Vasani's trap sprung. There had to be some sort of hormonal trigger, buried insidiously deep in their genes, primed to spring when the poor men were at their happiest. It caught some of them at dinner, some in Congress, others as they dandled their daughters on their knee and promised they'd never leave home again. It would have begun with an invasive squirming beneath the skin, I know now that this was their circulatory system uprooting and moving into a new position. That squirming would have become a burning as every connective subdermal fiber in them began to creep like a million millipede feet. How they must have fought their twisting, nodding flesh, trying to push their drifting eyes back into place, to keep their ears from crawling into new positions, all uselessly. They could only watch as their skin blanched with a grave shroud complexion and as their eyes, noses, and mouths gravitated together into new configurations too petite for their skulls. If they kept their wits, they thought of knives. That, or hot irons, to cauterize the creep of features. But nothing could stop it, 
much less reverse it. And when it was done, the children they'd longed to hold looked up into 27 gibbering facsimiles of Vasani stereo. By morning, the Empire knew monsters were real. What can some nano mesh do against that? What can any armor do? What can trenches and bunkers and miles of distance and sloshing seas do? What can they do against a knife that can descend anywhere upon anyone? 13 minutes, 30 seconds. You're chewing, doctor. She's right. I spit my fingers out, jam them in my pockets. And you're mad. Vasani tilts her head, a quizzical look left incomplete. Now that I think of it, I can't remember when she last blinked. That's a funny thing to say. Had your forces cleared the valley, it would have meant a bloody battle. Your soldiers ran home instead of into our bayonets. Most of them, at any rate. They ran into mental wards. I hissed through gritted teeth. They ran from something they couldn't escape, that you set upon them. They ran off with their futures ahead of them, Dr. Nichere. That's more than his perpetuity offered when he ordered them into the meat grinder. My every fibril tenses when Vasani begins to pace. Her bare feet suck softly at the concrete, as close to the red circle as they can without touching it. Does she know she's frittering away my time? Her time? Our time? A wormier thought. Is this a ploy? You still had to capture all those soldiers you warped. You had to lay your hands upon them to ruin them. Hands that once met in the guts of a rocket. How can you say you achieved this second impossible cut? Turn it around, doctor. They were not my subjects. They were my instruments. And through them, I reached the Empire's heart. That was where I made my incision. Her fingers upon her breast, an untrimmed nail digging into her flesh, making it blush. The untethered cut is the cut that appears anywhere. On any flesh, on any continent, past any defense. Sons, daughters, fathers, sisters, lovers, enemies. When you can perform this cut, you will have transcended the boundary of distance, and the world will never feel safe again. Is that what you call an efficient use of pain? What did you even achieve besides misery? She stops her pacing suddenly, and so does my pulse. All the peaks in my biorhythm flatten into a silent line. The core of human fear is the unknown. That is what Vasani is now. Quite deliberately, I think. Some crimes decouple ability from the limitations of flesh. That is why I flush cold when she doesn't blink. Why I start at every motion she makes. There is no knowing what that motion might make of me. You know you're perfectly safe, Dr. Nichere. She grins, her point eloquently made. No one will be until your head rolls, I throw back, suppressing a shudder. You're right. I showed them their emperor was neither a lion nor a son, and he could not protect them nor save them from what lurks in the dark. But it wasn't enough, I'm quick to remind her. Not for the emperor's honor. I wretch at the notion, but for spite. In spite of everything you did, the war continued. Ten minutes, one second. The Unique Cut When I think back upon the schisms, I imagine a no-man's land overcast by two shadows, but that's the bias of first-person memory. All I did was pack men into tanks. The real war was between Vasani Stereo and his perpetuity, the emperor of all Quintal Zia. That man did not feel what his body felt. That much I can't argue. Princes of the imperial family are born into a complex of nested seraglios, known as the Tesseract Halls, at the center of which a developing child cannot possibly catch a whiff of the real world. Hence, his war verve remained a straight line while public enthusiasm dropped at a sharp angle. It didn't seem to matter what new thing to fear she discovered. Waves of dissent met riot shields and broke. 
Mag trams kept freighting fresh recruits toward the front and returning only empty seats. All of this meant that a war we should have lost continued, and Vasani's tactics continued to evolve. Nevertheless, the two fed into one another. The Emperor's only response to the newest atrocity was rageful escalation, in turn prompting some of Vasani's worst, most ingenious inventions. In response to his encircling of Grivbank, she unveiled the Finger Eater and sent his men into a rout. At the Hydrochloric Falls, she presented a piece dubbed the Living Skeleton. Two and ten live witnesses took their own lives. Amidst the siege at Steampike Castle, Vasani somehow spirited away a senior officer and reinterpreted him as something papers called the Tear-Stained Puzzle Box, which remains tragically unsolved to this day. There were other examples I could recall. Vasani always was a restless tinkerer. But some memories go into you like shrapnel, and it's safer to leave them be. Steampike Castle still fell, but the poor officer's fate was a tipping point back at the capital. Bassani Stereo seemed impossible to capture. The woman was a ghost haunting abandoned labs full of half-baked horrors. She'd transformed herself into a magical evil that could snatch up anyone, anywhere, and do anything to them. When citizens no longer felt safe in their homes, they took to the streets. Soldiers stopped enlisting and began deserting in greater numbers. Curfews and public executions scaffolded everyday life in the same brutal military logic that held the war together. Faced with domestic mayhem, the sapphired throne elected to ignore it. For all of the above, the foxes were losing. Fasani's creation strangled public morale, but they couldn't make up for the quantum flame rockets or my inversion mines, nor topple the implacably stomping trench walkers I devised to trample enemy emplacements. I built the Emperor all the excuse needed to continue as he always had, but only I seemed to notice that Vasani's methods were growing more meticulous, less bloody, though my warnings went unheard. All I could do with all my power was tighten the screws on the war machine. Days and nights spun into a crepuscular blur as I worked myself to insomniac extremes, devising new technologies, more powerful weapons. I must have believed that by fine-tuning my craft I could eliminate all but that one miraculous invention that, with just the touch of a button, would instantly neutralize Vasani's stereo. Surely it was somewhere in my imagination. That was my naivety, not realizing Vasani believed something similar. Originality, I say. That's your third ideal. I'm against the wall now. I have to sit and hold my knees. It's that or bite myself. People always adapt to suffering. Souls scab over if not freed. Negative feedback loops. You know what I mean. Nerve boredom. I'm rambling as I do when overstimulated. It's better than chewing. Keep calm, carry on. Keep calm, carry on. That's what we're coded to do. And to get around that, you issued yourself a challenge never to make the same cut twice. It's hard to look at her now. I don't know what I'm seeing. The mind I glimpse is vast and tentacular. Instead, I look down. Seven minutes, 19 seconds. We live with the wounds that don't kill us, she says approvingly. Even when they bleed and bleed and bleed. And wherever it might be made, one little scratch is just that. A scratch. And so I set off towards a third impossible cut. If the untethered cut is liberated from space, the unique cut transcends the past. It is the cut that never repeats and therefore cannot be anticipated. She reaches so easily into my complexities. It's true. I was only ever reacting to Vasani. I built weapons to sink thunder cruisers and turn hostiles to glass. But in retrospect, I was repeating the same old stratagem, the only one I knew. And meanwhile, I was complacent. Yes, but luckily for you, I failed. What? Vasani spreads her hands. No matter what I did, I couldn't reach the Emperor. I fell just short of infinite. And meanwhile, that mind of yours trampled on like a town-leveling juggernaut. 
Now look at us. You are still my teacher, Dr. Nichere. In the end, I could never best you. With an oh well sort of shrug, she turns her back. Tell his porcine perpetuity whatever you please. It won't do him any good. In the end, it didn't help me either. I wait, but her silence goes on and on. Is that it? I glance at my bracelet. No, we aren't done. Five minutes. The war may not have stopped, I say, rising shakily to my feet. But neither did you, and you would never fight a battle you couldn't win. There must be something more at work. This third cut, it really isn't one cut, is it? It's every cut you make, an endless creative challenge. No, a very finite narrowing of both technique and possibility to the eventuality that no cut can be made at all. You could have reused your ever-stinging ants or given everyone in the capital your face, but you didn't, even when it would have saved your life. Instead, you chose always to innovate no matter what, to push the boundaries of your craft past the borders of known science. The autoquill whirs closer, as if hanging on my every word. And yet, I continue, a certain theme runs through your methods. It was present from the beginning, I just didn't see it until now. For a handful of bug bites, you turned the tide of a siege. You lent your face to the nightmares of millions without a single death. But your victims were never actually your victims. You let that much slip yourself. It was all about making wives weep and children wake up screaming at the memories of their fathers, yes, but also about learning. No. Elimination. The unique cut isn't a peak. It's a method hidden in a method. A hidden path to... to... silence again, but for the sub-audible dribbling of time out of the world. There is a fourth impossible cut, isn't there? My question throbs out into her cell's white void. Bare feet shuffle on cold stone. Vasani's smile makes me remember when our bitten fingers first touched within the innards of a rocket. Hers are eyes that say, I am feeling what you feel, remembering what you remember. What you see in me is what I see in you. After all this time, she murmurs, you are still my teacher. The last time we met was not the last time we spoke. Why do we aim shells at armies? My kitchen. The yellow table. The purpling evening through the window. The lime green tiles above the countertop flecked red from my cutting board. Clad. My cleaver whacks the head off a plucked field fowl, and blood helpfully leaves the body. A pot simmers on the island stove behind me, salivating for meat. She sits over the counter beyond it smeared by steam. Why not aim them at kings? Wouldn't that save everyone a lot of trouble? To this day, I am not sure why she asked. From where I stand on the autistic spectrum, it is hard for me to read the currents that move individuals along. The face is beautiful beyond scrutiny. I understand people better in aggregate. When a population smiles, it is easier for me to understand why, but Vasani was always, in every regard, alone. Kings, I told her, are hard to reach. Clat, clat, clat. The bird spills open in fatty pages. When I was seven, I tell her, my family was displaced from a kingdom that no longer exists. The old king died and his nephew came next to sit the throne. Though ill, he fitted. A sneering boy tyrant who believed a boy's war would make him a man. A king is his country's dignity. When they drag him before a greater king and defile him with bayonets, what does that make us? I reach for vegetables next, ripe and sweating. Three years I spent barefoot on a mass resettlement march to a barren corner of the empire. The harsh road took my younger brother first. A soldier's warning shot killed my mother's leg, and when father's heart gave up on carrying her, she gave up herself and let the endless procession swallow her. Two sisters went on until the soldiers took the elder, never to be seen again. Only two blackened feet and a hard-won certainty reached my new home, that if on the first day of war we had been annihilated completely, we would have at least all gone together. 
For a time, I dreamed of a magical bomb. A magical bomb, she murmurs thoughtfully. One that kills only kings, hmm? Done. I take my cutting board to the salivating pot. Hiss. The broth foams with relish. The fact is this. The nation is a body. The king is the brain and the hands are his legions. Another fact. When threatened, the brain reflexively puts its hands in harm's way. You've seen it. That instinct manifest. For the sake of survival, the brain will sacrifice everything but itself. The head is always the last to die. Tut. That's a broken metaphor. The hands are their own beings. Should they not be spared? When possible, yes, but it is rarely so. I remind her that the enemy is a body too. They deserve everything that we do. But if we must fight them anyway for whatever stupid reason, then let us make it as bloodless as possible. Bloodless and brief for all involved. The mercy of overwhelming firepower, my student notes dryly. The mercy of euthanasia is what I say. Oh? When you called the enemy a body, I didn't know you meant the four-legged sword. Four-legged, four-legged. That is little Vasari sing-songing from the floor behind her as he stacks his blocks in coated columns. He loves to build things, my youngest son. I hope he turns out nothing like me. The brain puts the hands before it, murmurs Vasani. But isn't hurt felt in the brain? As she said, it is a broken metaphor. In the coming years, I'll wish that I'd been more careful with it. Broken, Mama! Vasari's delighted cry heralds a smack in a clatter of building blocks across the floor. I laugh, and even Vasani almost chuckles as he gathers them up to begin again, and meanwhile the pot fills my kitchen with savory steam. The dish I am cooking is almost done, and it's time laid the plates out side by side. Mine and hers, hers and mine. There are memories that go on a shelf beside the heart. The unhealing cut extracts the fullness of pain but leaves an unsightly mark. The untethered cud is free to strike anywhere, but still requires the analog passage of edge through flesh. The unique cut hurts like the first you ever felt, every time, but some cannot be cut by knives alone. Some are too thick in hide and head, but there is a cut that does not parse flesh, a cut that leaves no wound at all. The torturer's hands flower open, two lopsided albino stars. She takes one step, two, arms extending, starved tendons protracting. Her palms flatten perpendicular to the circle of red paint and mime a more solid wall into being, her fingertips all but indenting from pressure. My gaze lingers there. Her hands, the few fingernails she has left are rusted chisels but the pads beneath them are as immaculate as if she never once chewed them. Only when you have exhausted all other cuts will you find it, Vasani continues with a mounting grandiosity. We must search for it amongst the vitals, within the soul. Do you remember the tear-stained puzzle box? Remember how two armies stopped to stare? That unlucky man was my instrument and all who witnessed him, my subjects. By the time the war entered its final stages, I was pushing you back for a pittance of blood, while back home I was strangling your will to fight. Whatever form of torture we prefer, the goal is always to achieve maximal consequence through minimal violence. The acme of torture is simply success. It is a singularity of achievement where technique sublimates into will. When you can make a subject scream without a touch, you can do anything, even stop a war, though in that I fell a little short. Her cackle fills the room inescapably. You told me it couldn't be done, but I did it. His hands whole, his belly rolls unblemished, his very body unbloodied. <laughs> Suddenly she is shouting. 
His perpetuity will never understand. He is the sniveling, selfish monster mind that throws its hands up before a knife. And I, I, I am the knife that loves the flesh and only cuts evil where it hurts. Where, doctor? Where? The brain, I finish hollowly. Nowhere, she corrects. And in a dizzying rush, it all connects, and I glimpse the sinews of logic conjoining the brilliant young woman I knew to this creature before me. I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it, but her logic is so vivid in its twisted, mutilated symmetry, and I am so attuned to patterns in the fabric of things visible and not that I cannot help but think as she thinks for a gut wringing second, and I perceive the world emergent from its rampant fractalization. Name it, doctor. I know you can. Name it. Name it. She almost seems to speak through me. The bloodless cut. I have never known Vasani Stereo to laugh, but now she does. As with everything about her, it is a performance. Her eyelashes flutter and her cheeks pull back from her teeth like washed out curtains revealing a display of mummified heads. Her mouth is a hole where a victim decomposed, the knife still in their back, and from it sounds a titter tinged with the sweet perfume of rot-riddled gums. All I can do is cower against the wall in absolute, electrifying dread. I was wrong to believe her immune to prison. It got into her like a cavity, rotting her from the inside. It is just too easy to forget that she is human when I shouldn't. For human is the most terrible thing that a monster can be. Three minutes. In the end, Vasani's stereo was not some intangible spirit of pain. There was a body there, however foxly it ran and hid. My understanding is that someone on the other side eventually grew disgusted with her and gave up her location. War can be ordinary like that. I arrived by aerocopter at her secret compound high up in the frozen crags of Coldfire Mountain, just a week after she was captured. The wind tried to rip my hair away as it fled, the sun just a neon rim along that shadow peak, almost gone. I reported to the camp commander, ate a tasteless ration in my habitat, and forged directly into Vasani's lab. While I'd advocated leveling the mountain with a bomb, the emperor wanted it scrubbed of its every last secret and in the end I couldn't resist the lore either. I was bundled against the lab's sterile chill and breathing out vaporous ghosts. A security detail went ahead of me into those dimly lit tunnels, clearing out booby traps left for the unwary. I'd expected displays of invented lethality, not simple explosives disarmed without casualties. They seemed almost perfunctory. It was as if she knew she'd be found and couldn't resist giving her enemies a last tweak on the nose. I won't relate what I found there. I can't. All I can say is this. If you twist and construe and deconstruct a living body long enough, it will die. But at the point of balance between those two polarities, it becomes something close to art. The soldiers found me retching in the snow outside. I might have stayed there forever had one not said, Ma'am, you should have a look at this. They'd found a sealed room in the back of the complex one that mysteriously unlocked at their approach. I'll go, I said. And the rest? Burn them. I could smell it hovering around that steel door in the depths of the lab, a sweet sour muddling of dung and disinfectant. It misted in the air as the identity beam scanned me and then turned green as it had for the guards. It was instantly plain to me that Vasani would have seen the foxes losing, would have known she'd be captured and would have formulated accordingly. And I knew that the wise thing to do was report that I'd found nothing. My chest was colder than the mountain air. Sometimes you can hear the future screaming the answer at you. I'm not sure why I chose to ignore it. I couldn't have known what I'd find inside. It was like a moment I'd already lived repeating itself in the nightmare of a Merchelle Nitre who'd already made this mistake. My thumb brushed the door, and it opened like a gift box. A living stink gusted from the dark within. Vasani always knew more than she should. 
We both knew the emperor wouldn't relent no matter the cost. But inexplicably, she knew one other thing that I did not. More than big meals and bloodshed, she knew the emperor loved his wife. Two minutes, three seconds. You didn't achieve a fucking thing, I manage, lest Vasani's madness swallow me whole. Her hyenoid mirth subsides. Oh. The emperor still bled in the end. That was his choice. He made the right one. Not that this brother of his is any better. There's an image that throbs inside my head. Sometimes softly enough that I can present a facade of normality. Sometimes so loudly that it is all I can see and I must scream and scream until it subsides. It is a wound unlike any made before or after it. A cut made without puncturing the skull. A cut that will never close because it never bled to begin with. You didn't give him a choice, I say. Vasani, you did the worst thing anyone has ever done. I utter this as plainly as the fact deserves. Someone had to, she replies, just as matter-of-factly. And the Empress? Her expression is beatific. Ah, you see, that is how you touch the sublime. Even she did not bleed. Bassani's head tilts slowly back and her open palms lift heavenward. Something for nothing. She seems to shower in an imaginary light from an imaginary firmament. The impossible from my hands. Are you not awed? Consequence without pain. Pain without a cut. A cut without blood. Blood without consequence. This is the better way, doctor. The end of war itself, it is like a miracle. The miracle of the bloodless cut. Finally, the moment for the words I carried to her all these years. You're a monster. The torturer's hands descend, a certain light leaving her. That's rich. I look up and watch two tears make trails down her cheeks. I try to tell myself that I know better, that true or false these tears are just another act. But that's the thing about Vasani. She's human. All humans contain truths. Anything she shows me could be real. Sometimes I have nightmares about the millions we might have killed together, she says. All those children you made orphans will grow up broken, yes, but they will grow up. I took their pain without a knife and left them their lives. Pieces of lives, I spit back at her. Fucking stumps of lives. Stumps I gave them to try and fix what you did. A miserable giggle spills out of her. And here I thought you only saw humans in deep enough burn pits. I see them for what they are. Beautiful vessels of possibility. And consequence. And love and brilliance and pain. Years you pelted me with peacock soldiers, wasting all they could have been. How could I hurt my fellow men with such great care unless I loved them more than you? Then, before my eyes, her face warps like nightmare stuff. Suddenly, she is shrieking, spittle flecking from black gums, her eyes leaking liquid hate. You're the monster! You, Merchelle Nitre! Everything I did could have come to something if not for you, who damned the world rather than stop butchering children, you barren-hearted, unstoppable steel creature! On and on, her frothing rage strobes over me more than I can process, a leveling bombardment that drives me cringing into the corner. Are these emotions real? Are they fake? I cannot tell. This could all be another performance, but if not, then the worst has come to pass. Empathic overload drives my fingers to my teeth and there is pain, mine, something I can clasp to keep from being swept away. My bracelet rattles warning against my varicose wrist. One minute, three seconds. One minute, two seconds. One minute, one second. One. The last time we spoke was not the last time we met. Vasani reached the strike site three hours before me, 
my aerocopter being delayed by malfunction. From the air, the enemy war camp seemed untouched, but this wasn't the kind of devastation you saw with a bomb. On descent, I was given a rebreather to wear in case traces of our weapons still lingered on that salt plane's paralyzed winds. This was nothing to do with peacocks and foxes, I should say. This was another war, another foe. The schism was still weeks away. The invading veridic technomads were warned what would happen if they kept pushing into empire domains. Now, they were a successful test of our newest microbial weapon. A sleepy sort of autopilot setting seemed to move our soldiers about their business, which was gathering the dead and laying them out in a flat clearing. This was common soldier work, but these bodies were difficult. They didn't drag right. They had to be carried. They were hard to look at. Current estimate has it close to 7,000, the supervising commissar informed me. I thanked him for the report and asked him where Vasani was. I lingered there to direct the organization of incoming cadavers according to my preferences, then found an empty tent where I could weep in the dark. Afterwards, I went looking for Vasani. Tents billowed on endlessly like the sails of a fleet sunk hopelessly in the sand. Their snapping was the only sound. The first rows were empty. The latter would be soon. I found my student squatting before an open tent. I asked what she'd found. She said nothing. Venturing closer, I saw why. Torque dust is a synthetic bacterium meant to be dispersed in cloud form by an aerocopter. Once inhaled, it attacks the vertebral ligaments and hyperinflames them until they cause the body to break its own neck. Instantly lethal in 99 out of 100 cases. These two were unexceptional. Comrades? Lovers? I couldn't tell. The wind-blown infection had caught them both in nude embrace, slipped in on the breaths they filled with one another's scent, took root, and then contorted their skulls 180 degrees so that the last thing they saw was nothing. I told Vasani we'd found no survivors. Every respiring thing in a miles-long tract was fatally rotated, down to the twisted lizards and the little wretched mice. Vasani said nothing. I said that the enemy commander just transmitted terms of surrender. It's over. Nothing. It was instant for them, I said. Then she said, for ninety-nine and a hundred. A sweetly sulfurous stink reached my nose. A yellow pool was growing slowly beneath the leftmost body, a girl. My gaze traveled up a body that sagged as abandoned flesh should, going first by mistake to where her face should be, just a skirt of ringlets there, then over to the other side where it was now. Blue eyes shot with blood flicked to mine. A purpled lip twitched. In the girl's piss puddle, I glimpsed Vasani staring, not at the bodies, but at me, my wavering reflection. Waiting, it felt, for what her teacher had to say. I take my fingers from my mouth. The taste of iron remains. You steel creature. And yet I bleed. Red wells plentifully from the impressions of my teeth. This cut is not so bloodless. Vasani is not the all-seeing demon she presents as. Infinite compassion is not something I ever thought I had. No one does, and that is right. I do not understand people very well, and those I do often disappoint me. But I can love people, and they're sometimes sad, sometimes beautiful mosaics. I can trust that in aggregate they suffer as I suffer, laugh as I laugh, and love as I love. Even now I wish I could trust Vasani that way, but that's what a lie does. A lie is a cut. Your world, my world. That mark there, between them. If everything that Vasani did really was to outmode me, then I would be released. It would mean that I hadn't loved a monster, only made one. But. But in me, unextractable by science, the fear that this creature the government caught, or thinks it caught, is a fake and she's free right now and sharpening her knives, her tools, and that fear will always be there, and that is her fault. Fifty seconds. What if I told you that auto quill isn't recording, I ask. 
What? Her eyes pinched and flicked to the bee buzzing machine. I never turned it on. I reach for it as I stand. Why not? She demands hotly. The auto quill nestles into my palm and retracts its rotos. Go still. Emperor be damned, I say. I wasn't going to lose this chance to speak to you one last time, but I still don't know whether I created you or you created yourself. I don't think I ever will. What I do know is that I'll never get the truth from you. I raise a finger. Except for one thing. And what is that? That this was never about right and wrong with you. It was about you. When you were about to lose, you decided to die famously. You'll go to the gallows tall and proud, where the world will see you smile as you drop and think that you were right. Battle fought with machines will become a thing of the past. There will be no peace through fear, but instead a new and crueler kind of war, where battles rage across bodies instead of battlefields. All in honor of your genius. But you don't deserve that. I'm glad I killed you, Vasani. I lift the file from my pocket and show it to her. Her tears have all dried up. The performance is over. Vasani confirms nothing, only stares. What is that? Many sleepless nights I guessed futilely what had made Vasani put on fox ears. The Emperor's cruelty seems likely. His belligerence, his excesses, his pointless wars... If not, perhaps those nestled lovers lie forever in her eyes. Maybe it was what I said over dinner. Maybe it was all of that or nothing I can possibly imagine. Whatever it was, it doesn't matter now. There's a point between their most innocent and their most monstrous where nothing you know of a friend can undo what they become. I really believed there was one invention that would defeat Vasani Stereo instantaneously. A magic bomb. I'd failed to find it. Our forces took her anticlimactically with weeks of fighting left to go. I was too late to stop her. Instead, I discovered a different kind of miracle. This is a ferrolipid solution with a modicum of intelligence. I call it the Nemophage. Her eyes follow its spellbinding silver swirl. Once it enters the bloodstream, it is designed to seek out and kill those regions of the brain that house certain memories. The problem is that it doesn't know which memories are stored where. For it to function properly, the subject must be made to consciously recall those memories you wish to eliminate. This causes the corresponding neurons of the brain to light up, and in doing so, lower the nemophage toward them. The process takes time. Vasani isn't anywhere in her expression. How long? A little over 20 minutes. Vasani screams and tries to lunge across the red paint circle. The second her fingers pierce that implicit barrier, the light in the cell turns red, and segmented metal cords erupt from the wall to bind her arms and legs, pinioning her above her stool, still shrieking with rage. Was I your subject, Vasani? You ruined me all the same. Now that she's immobile, I feel safe enough to take a slow stroll around her cell. I don't think I was meant to see what I saw in your laboratory. That's war, I suppose. Mostly collateral damage. I always felt I was above murder, but it turns out I was really only distant from it. Vasani tries to lunge again, but the cords hold her fast. She can only spit and snarl. In just a few moments, you will lose yourself. All of you will be gone except the parts that did nothing wrong. An innocent woman will go to the guillotine, never knowing why the world hates her. It will see what's become of her, and they'll fear to become her too. I glance down. Three seconds. Reads my bracelet. Two. One. All that, I say, without a drop of blood. The tears in her eyes blend with the froth around Vasani's defiant rectus. You... You could have hidden what you saw, but you didn't, did you? No, no. You showed it to the Emperor because you knew I was right. You knew I was right and you hated it. Admit it, monster. You should be where I am. Well, execute us both, I say. Student and teacher. 
Let our heads roll together. Such are her last coherent words. The rest is all screaming. My head is spinning when the cell door slams shut behind me, propelled around and around by an alarm that roars like rocket fire. Several guards are sprinting toward me, but I'm 20 minutes past their saving and drifting further into negative time with every passing second. Without much thought, I fish the file from my pocket and hold it to my eye. Not empty, in fact. A drop or two still quivers at the bottom. One for each dosage it contained. My knees give out, and the file tumbles from my palsying fingers. It bursts open and rolls, describing its death arc. A silvery thumbnail, obliterated by oblivious boot heels. One guard trying to help me up, another urging me to stay down all inaudible over the blaring klaxon. Vision dimming, head sinking. Quick, what hope did I allow myself? My assistants have the nemophage formula now. It's theirs to make of it what they will. Maybe a new kind of death to those in need. A more selective one. Taking only what you can't bear to live with. Maybe. If I've taught them wisely, but I'll never know. The guard is pelting off, calling for help. The Emperor will soon rue my failure. He'll punish me before I die, if uncreatively. Is that what I deserve? I'll never know that either. Not with my mirror broken. My thoughts are elsewhere. Broken, Mama. Hands and knees now, sinking fast. Vasari, my son, my littlest one. God, why did Vasani have to name him? Why shine his face so brightly on the surface of my memory? The nemophage can't pass him now. In just a few moments, I'll no longer be a mother. My son will never understand why I don't love him anymore. I can't stop myself from screaming. A wordless plea for my next self to please hurry and be me so that she can suffer instead. This hurts as only a bloodless cut can. That was The Bloodless Cut by Evan Marcroft. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love it if you'd leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever platform you listen to us on. Or better yet, share the magazine and podcast with a friend. If you'd like to listen to more speculative fiction, visit us online at magazine.metaphoricist.com, on blue sky at metaphoricist.bsky.social, or on Mastodon at metaphoricist at writing.exchange. Dot